Christos Anesti. Christ is risen. Christos vos crece. Voistino vos crece. That's the, that's the Slavonic. So today is our second to last session on the councils. And today we're going to talk about the seventh ecumenical council. And the seventh ecumenical council was held in the year 787 AD. And it was called by the Empress Irene. Quick quiz. Who knows your church history? What do we do in church every year that commemorates the seventh ecumenical council? I'll give you a hint. It's the first Sunday of Lent. Sunday of Orthodoxy. And the icon procession. You passed the quiz. You passed the quiz. Congratulations. 76% is a passing grade. I didn't say I was going to give an A. Passing or failing, what's the difference? So, icons are the big thing on the Seventh Ecumenical Council. So we know, of course, as Father Sampson wrote in the bulletin, this is, for a long time, there's this raging debate about icons in the church, whether we should have them, whether we shouldn't have them, the, uh, the reality of the influence of Islam on the church, because Islam has a prohibition to any symbols. If you look in, for example, uh, in the mosques, you'll see geometric shapes and things, but you won't see people depicted. So there was some of that influence, of course, because Islam had, be had been growing for a while uh, there in the East. But ultimately, the church sat down, and ultimately the church made a decision, icons are good. But there's a very specific, remember I've been talking about all of the things that the councils did were about the theology and the truth of whom. When the church has a dogma, remember we talked about this, the very first ecumenical council, the truth of what? Who are we talking about when we talk about truth in the church? Jesus Christ. All of the doctrines have to do with Jesus Christ. And so the truth of icons is only in the person of Jesus Christ. So what does that mean? We could say this, and this is how the council described it. Because the Son of God, because the incarnate Word of God became a human in the person of Jesus Christ, and because we could see him, we should depict him in icons. But we don't have icons of the Holy Spirit, except in the form of what? A dove. Because the scripture says, the Spirit came in the form of a dove. Or sometimes we hear, we see, for example, um, we see rays coming down, <coughs> representing the voice from heaven. Who is that? the Father. <coughs> Remember, they're all God, God the Father. But icons represent things that we can see. And because we've seen Jesus Christ, <coughs> the church says we can and should depict him in holy icons. I would say this in the opposite way. If we refuse to accept holy icons, then we do not believe in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. That's the essence of the truth of holy icons. <coughs> <coughs> Forgive me. Even in all the icons we see of the saints, all of the images are always reminding us of God's grace. The halo, I'm good. The halo 
represents the light of Christ coming from the saints. Everything that we have to do with holy icons is specifically because Jesus Christ came and dwelt among us and we could see him. Icons are not graven images. They are not idols. They are remembrances of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that is why you have heard me remind people often, because these are hard habits to break, that during Holy Communion, we should not be kissing icons. Right? So sometimes there's a big icon, like if it's the feast day, we have sometimes the feast day icon, you know, on the solea. And people will come and try to kiss the icon before and after communion. And I'm always reminding people, do not kiss icons during Holy Communion. kiss icons during Holy Communion. Why? Because you're taking the blood of Christ. You don't need it. Say that louder. You're partaking of the blood of Christ. You do not need an icon. You're partaking of the body and blood of Christ, not just the blood, the body and blood of Christ. But it's not just that you are parta partaking of it, that God is in our presence. Why would you kiss a picture of him when he's standing in your midst? Okay. And when we forget that, thank you, Charlie. When we forget that, <coughs> don't let me leave that there. Someone's bound to sit on it later. <laughs> when we forget why, icons are true, that's when we start losing focus. So it's not that it's bad to kiss icons, we have to remember their purpose. That, we sh that they, they remind us of God's universal presence. We put them in our cars, we put them in our offices, we put them in our homes, we put them in our cubicles if we don't have our own office, we put them in our kitchens, we put them everywhere to remind us of God's grace and God's presence and watching over us. Even, I remind, uh, not just young people really, but uh, when we're struggling with various passions, I remind people that put an icon in the place where we find ourselves sinning. And it will help remind us maybe to not sin, right? So I don't know how many of you are prone to road rage. Anyone want to volunteer? I, you look like a road rage kind of person. I don't know, maybe it's... Someone said Charlie Samarcus is prone to road rage. That's why, he, that's why he's an attorney. He can represent himself in terms of... <laughs> so, all right. So imagine how difficult would it be to give someone the one finger salute, as they say, if you have an icon of Jesus Christ on your dashboard. What are the chances that you're gonna start yelling profanities out the window when you're face to face with an icon of Jesus Christ? It's to remind us of God's universal presence. And so they're very helpful and they're very, it's, a, it's a great blessing for us. However, let's, let's be honest, we do kind of get a, a little um, twisted sometimes and we forget when we have sometimes, you know, like I said, we kiss the icons when we shouldn't kiss icons or what have you. But the, the other thing about icons, uh, and this is again something that is important to remember about truth. Icons, we're not up to free, uh, what, you, what um, free interpretation how to paint an icon because icons have to tell the truth and that of course we know is the problem with one of our icons in the church is the icon in the dome is not accurate it has been there for many decades 
We know it's not accurate, but as I've said before, it's also part of our history, and so in good time, we'll deal with that. But I might be old and gone, or gone, or old. However, we have to know that there's always an importance of truth. And just to clarify, the reason that icon is wrong is because it depicts God the Father, and we've never seen God the Father. Okay, and so we should not have icons of God the Father. But it is also part of our history. It kind of found its way into the church, and now slowly churches are removing them, right? This is also part of our living history. It's not just our church that has it. Churches all over the world have had them put in, and little by little churches are restoring themselves to a more correct to a more correct position. I think it's a beautiful expression of, you know, the reality of our history too and the, and, and the beauty of our human nature. So. so that is the Seventh Ecumenical Council. Now, the procession that we do on the Sunday of Orthodoxy commemorates that event. Not the council specifically, it's that after the council, Icons were literally brought back into the churches in a very ceremonial, ceremoniously, is that the right word? In a beautiful ceremony, the icons were brought back into the church. And so this is what the Sunday of Orthodoxy procession uh, commemorates, that historic event of the restoration of the icons. And to this day, of course, they have remained in our church. Uh, however, there it continues to be debates on whether we should have icons. Even within the church, people continue every now and then to bubble to the surface. But what did the church establish through all of these? Now, if you've been paying attention to all of these different conversations we've been having about all the different ecumenical councils, what, what is it about these truths at the council meetings? Can they be changed? No. No. And in the Seventh Ecumenical Council, it was not a random conversation. They went back and looked at the ancient tradition of the church, and they looked at the ancient practices of the church, and they made a doctrinal statement about Jesus Christ. Now here's another quiz for you. The oldest icon of the Panagia, of the Virgin Mary. It is the icon that the Paraclesis is dedicated to, and there's a hymn at the end of the Paraclesis which calls her the Directress. It's an icon where she is directing all of our attention to her son. Pop quiz, who painted the first icon of the Panagia? St. Luke, you've been doing your homework, <laughs> bravo so. St. Luke, the evangelist, and the icon still exists. So, if icons were so wrong, why would Luke, the evangelist, have painted one of the Panagia? And why would the church have had an icon of the mother of God if they were so bad? Right? And so this is the connection the church has. Remember the Gospel of John, before Christ goes on the cross, Christ tells the disciples, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and guide you into all truth. We can rest comfortably in the traditions and the teachings of the Holy Apostles. And so here is the evangelist Luke who gives us a gospel and the book of Acts. And he actually wrote, painted the first icon of the Panagia. So using the most basic of contemporary English ex expressions, good enough for them, good enough for me. You know, if it's good enough for St. Luke, I think it's good enough for me to have, to have comfort in that. So. Where? That's at Mount Athos. Yes? Iconographers, as I understand it, traditionally, once a, a saint or if it's the Theotokos, once that has been done, all the, 
all future iconographers will will basically attempt to copy that. Yes. Because that's the truth. So, so I, I'm wondering now with St. Luke's version, have the iconographers since St. Luke uh, have attempted, obviously the, and you can find it, you can find St. Luke's uh, icon, you can find it on the internet, but it is, it's very, very difficult to see because it's too, you know. It's 2,000 years old. years old, and it's, you know, they get darkened by age and all that. But have the iconographers, you know, going back to, to even, you know, shortly after St. Luke's time, would they have attempted to, to reproduce what St. Luke Yeah, so there's, there, there's a beautiful question. So uh, let's talk specifically about the Panagia for a minute. There are a variety of icons of the Panagia, and you'll notice a lot of them have different names, and they commemorate different aspects of her and her life, right? So, you know, for example, we have a very Western icon on our icon screen of the Panagia, but in the narthex we have a very traditional icon of the Panagia. So you have the, you have some of the Panagia, one, for example, one beautiful icon of the Panagia is called the Sweet Kissing, where Christ is giving her a kiss on the cheek. You see these different, and they express the different truths of the Panagia's relationship with Christ. You, I'm going to say, almost never see just the Panagia by herself. Isn't that only in the Catholic Church? Well, you do see it here sometimes. But the reason you almost never see her by yourself, pop quiz, why? Because what gives her her importance is Christ, right? She's the mother of God. The one time I've seen it in the church without Christ is she has a tear. And it represents that time when he's come down off of the cross right, and after his crucifixion, and then he's gone. Because after his resurrection, 40 days later, he goes back, but she's still alive. So every now and then you'll see her with a little tear in her eye, and you'll not see her holding Christ. And that often represents that time when she's without her son because of the crucifixion. That's why she's weeping, right? But otherwise, you will not see her by herself, right? Unless sometimes... You know, if you see it like in scenes, like, here's an icon, right, of, of Ipapandi, the presentation of Christ in the temple. So you see her, you see Christ, you see um, uh, Simeon, you see Joachim and Anna. Now, if someone were to capture a portion of that icon that did not include the Christ child, and reproduced it, let's say, like by a picture. You would see her without Christ, but that's because someone took a picture of something larger and didn't include everything. So you always have to say, what icon are we looking at? And so the important thing to always be aware is, am I looking at an original icon? And chances are, like at the bookstore or really like in our, in our homes, unless we're wealthy, we don't have original icons in our homes. Right? We have someone who has taken beautiful photographs of them and they've mass produced them and put them on wood and what have you. So what we are getting at home is a picture of an original somewhere. And you always have to say, well, if something looks strange in the, in the wooden icon I have, is that maybe because there's something that wasn't captured in that picture? Right? Or, for example, you see pictures of our church, you see pictures of the dome. If someone were to make an icon of that, they'd say, well, wait a minute, I thought we weren't supposed to have icons of that because they captured something, you know, in the dome and then reproduced it. So you always have to ask the question, where is the icon coming from? And that's why I know, for example, in the bookstore, the bookstore is very careful to research and to properly vet the sources of the icons. You know, we're not going to buy icons from a Roman Catholic production company because they're not going to be careful of the necessary details because their icons don't have the same requirements that our icons have, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, if that makes any sense, right? And even some of our, you know, like our stained glass window, these are not, they are icons, but they're not icons. 
right? So the stained glass window, the artist who did them was not necessarily being loyal to the teachings of the church. It's one of the difficulties of having the stained glass is because the, the, the artist wasn't orthodox at all. You know, they're beautiful windows. They are classic and they are priceless windows. But we can't look to the windows to say, now there's an interesting truth because the windows do not necessarily convey the truth, right? Because they're not icons in the same sense as the other. So that's an important distinction for us to make is where is the truth in that particular, in that particular thing? What time is it? 10 till. 10 till. Look at that.